Nation Sports Talk Wednesday. It's Notre Dame football midweek mailbag spring practice edition. We had a little glimpse of practice this morning. Not a whole lot, you know, so like what we actually gleaned from there, you know, but hey, it's the restart of spring after they started two weeks ago and then got a week off for, for spring Truth. break. They're back at practice today on a uh it's as cold as it's been probably in the last month as well <laughs> out there today that, that wind out there today Ooh. was brutal okay it was yes. cold out there wow we've got some guys who have been working overtime getting here early so i think salty's been salty was at least gone yesterday i think tommy was as well i want to say salty might not have been here on monday or if he was it didn't seem like he was here <laughs> for that long but um He's working He's overtime, putting in the questions. Yeah, <laughs> back with a vengeance. Considering his first post was at five oh eight. By yeah. the way, so oh my gosh, really? I didn't even yeah. notice that. Yeah, <laughs> he was sitting there having a cocktail or two. Hey, getting more ready power to tool, popping open his uh, salty peanuts and having a, having a good time. Yes, exactly. Here's an interesting one that he that he posted. I don't know, like if you have any idea for this. He says podcast chats offer features such as edit and gifting in which a month of IB board membership can be gifted, which features should be added to the IB chat. So is, are, are people hoping that they're going to start gifting each other? Like the a month of board opportunities basically, uh, or are we supposed to be gifting that away? Like, right. What, what does that mean exactly? I think that that uh, that's almost a you know more a question for guys like Salty and and other people in the chat, right? Because like they're the ones, they're the ones who use the chat more frequently. This We're is true. Just looking at this the is chat, true. I responding I, to the chat. So. I suppose there's some people out there that might gift uh, a month of the board to somebody or, or whatever, but uh, you can still do that. You just got to find out who these people are in real life and. Uh, you can gift them some time on the board. That can definitely be a thing. Yeah. Salty said he was only here at the beginning of both shows. His leash gets yanked at 630. Okay. So let me find a legitimate football question. Salty, no. you've got okay. a few questions pertaining to the offensive line, and we're going to kind of address that in rapid fire. So you might not be here by then if you uh, if your leash does get yanked. I see Man. Billy Shrout there. Um I'll go with a couple here. He says, Dylan Proctor transferred from Bama to Iowa, received NIL dollars at Iowa, then transferred back to Alabama all within three months and kept the NIL money. Should this be legal? I think this is a simple response. I mean, free enterprise, man. Like, I, <laughs> I don't, I honestly don't have, if, if that's what, if, if I was dumb enough to give him all the money up front, sorry. I mean, I, I well, these collectives, no these collectives, I thought like they sign contracts, I thought, with these players and stuff like that when they give them money. So if there's no stipulation in whatever agreement they come, you know, this is this is really not that different from the ACC and their grant of rights <laughs> deal. Yeah. Like if there's wording in the contract that says one way or another, it's a legal contract. You know, if everybody signs it and it's, you know, you've gone the proper steps to make it a legal document, I assume that that Dylan Proctor at the very least had some kind of agent, if not a lawyer, sure, you know, and, and vice versa with whatever the collective was with Iowa. So if Iowa didn't stipulate that he's got to give the money back, if he leaves, then it's on them. All's fair in love and Look, war. Right. If I decided to take a teaching job someplace else and they give me a signing bonus or whatever, or a Dean job someplace else. And they're like, Hey, we'll give you $10,000 to come and be the Dean at XYZ high school. And they hand me a check when I walk in the door. And then three months later, I decide, you know what? This job isn't for me. Yeah. You know, David says it's Caden Proctor. Okay. Not Dylan Proctor. Fair enough. So, I, mean, I did see the story on yeah. Twitter. So I do know what they're talking about. But I, I guess, look, the NIL is still a wild, wild west. There's no rules. And so 
the kids can take advantage of it, I guess. Don't give them all the money up front. That's on you. Sorry. I, I guess I don't have a problem with it. Yeah, I mean, in a perfect world, you give the money back. If you're not going to stay at the school that gave sure. you the money, then you give the money back. But if there's nothing in the agreement that says you have to give the money back, and like you brought up a job, I remember early in my illustrious radio <laughs> career <laughs> where you know it was a small market and you know i had come to the agreement with my boss because it was you know it was a stepping stone type job because it was an entry level type job and i said if i'm still here in a year how about a thousand dollar bonus you know for being here and he had kind of forgotten about it but hey he owed me the money so he gave me the money but then <laughs> But then like a month or two later, I found another job and I moved on. I sure didn't give the bonus back no. you know, because that was part of the deal. I was there. I, right. I fulfilled my part of the contract. I took the money. But see, here's the thing. NIL is supposed to be money for a service of some sort, right? Signing autographs, you know, whatever the case may be. So if he got the money and never did the service, then the contract should state that he shouldn't right. have the money. Right? right. Or you're stupid for paying him before he does the service. Right. So, you know, or you've given money for basically nothing. Well, that again, that's on the people that are giving out the money. If it's money for service and he did the service, let's say it was for signing autograph. I'm just I'm speaking whatever. So let's say it was for signing autographs and he did the autograph signing and then he got the money. Then that money's his. Doesn't matter whether he actually suits up with Iowa or not. Like that's on you guys for, for doing that. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So, yeah. you know, I don't have an issue with it. I really don't. I mean, look, is it at the end of the day, is it the right thing to do? Probably not. But I'm sure that these people are looking to screw kids over just as much as the kids are looking to screw them over. And I mean, the fact that he went back and forth to begin with. I mean, there's right. a lot, there's a lot yeah. there just without any NIL money. <laughs> Absolutely. So Absolutely. Because now Iowa has to look for another offensive lineman, you know? And so... Yeah, it's it's a whole thing, but yeah, I mean, look, he gets to keep the money. I, I don't have a problem with it if they're silly enough to do it the way they did it. I'm going to throw another salty question in there because he asked this one last week and we didn't answer oh. it. So I feel like this is going to be a reoccurring theme. He said, rank the greatest sports call of all time. Al Michaels, Miracle on Ice, Vin Scully, Boggs bottom of the ninth home run. Sean Steyer's Lady Irish ACC Championship final moments. Boggs ninth inning. I, I think. I think. He, are you thinking of Kirk Gibson bottom of the ninth? The Vin Scully call. They're salty. I don't remember like a Boggs call. I would rank them in that order, though. That's that's the order that I would go. Regardless, Look, your your national championship call was better, and and, and also your your baseball calls uh, when they went to the College World Series back in two thousand two. Those those were all gold. Gold, Jerry. They were gold. <laughs> <laughs> Much appreciated. Yeah, yeah. that's you know, like you know, it was the ACC thing. I've listened to it a couple of times. Brian put it up there on the boards last week. It you know, it was it hit the right notes or whatever. There also kind of had to be the right balance struck yeah. because for as many ACC championships as they have this is this is my first one and i couldn't act like they'd never won an acc championship before and just go nuts it's like it was their sixth championship right you know so is what it is yeah absolutely but i appreciate appreciate the love on the other one hey i let's call him how i see him okay just i'll answer brandon's question as well he asked how I came across oh, being the voice of Notre Dame women's one. basketball. Is that something you pursued through school broadcasting affiliate company? Yeah. So this is a great story. Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, how far back do you want me to start? This actually goes back to my army days. I went into the army thinking that I was going to, you know, I went in to learn a language. I learned Russian. I had a security clearance, all these different things. I thought I was going to come out working like for the FBI or the NSA <laughs> you know, some kind of spy, you know, whatever it happens. Yes, there, a you know, spy. That would have been great. <laughs> I would have never met you, but it would have been know, great. Right? So that's what I thought I was going to be. And then, you know, probably three of the four years in, I'm like, man, this, <laughs> I don't know. Like, working for the government, I just, based on my military experience, I just was not seeing a future on that side. And... You know, I love sports and some friends of mine were like, actually, you know, you love sports. Maybe you should think about 
doing that, you know? And so got out of the army, got into the university of Kansas, which again was kind of the, you know, pursuit and uh, started working for the student radio station and worked my way through, you know, a few different places and, um, was out in at a small market in Colorado. And I had been there for three years and, you know, there's like a couple of different websites, you know, with the job openings and all that different kind of stuff. And this is and, like, um, like early internet too, by the way. Yeah. And this is, this is the year 2000. This is yeah. the fall of 2000. Right. Like I got the job in Colorado because the other radio station I was at had a stack of like these, you know, radio newspaper slash magazines and they had classified ads in the back. And so that's how <laughs> I found the job in Colorado, you know, flash forward three years and it's like, you know, job postings on the internet, how novel, you know, and, <laughs> and, uh, you know, being a Notre Dame fan, I actually used to, you know, like search for, you know, like websites here in, in South Bend or whatever. So long story short or short story long, I, it, one day on this website, I come across a job opening for the radio station. They were the, you know, the flagship station for Notre Dame football. And the job was hosting a Notre Dame football pregame show doing play-by-play -play for Notre Dame women's basketball, doing play-by-play -play for Notre Dame baseball, and also being the sports guy on, on the morning show. U93 is a station here in town for people of, you know familiar with U93. This was obviously when they used to have the contract, they don't have it. Right. So that's, that's basically it. And I ended up getting the job. Um, I was not the first choice from what I had told, but the guy who I was replacing was actually – you know, part of the process. And there was something in, in my baseball, de there was something in my baseball demo where I was, I used to do junior college baseball when I was out there in Colorado. And um, it was one of these games where there were like a million home runs being hit. And so uh, the team that I, you know, did the play by play for Lamar community college, they were looking to make a pitching change. And so the guy who was going to go in the game had pitched a little bit, I think, the day before. And so he was sitting in the stands with the radar gun, doing huh. the radar gun. And he had just on, like, his regular turf shoes. And then the next thing you know, like, he's going to go in the game, but he's running all over the place looking for his cleats. He couldn't find his cleats. And so I'm talking about this in my demo. And that was kind of part of what caught, their, hilarious. caught their ears. So The, the non-play the non play stuff. Yeah, yeah. exactly. The, Which, the other stuff goes back to the point that I think I made a long time ago when you and I were talking, when you and I used to do some baseball games together, it is a, it's an art to be able to do a baseball game because there's so much dead time. You know, if you, if you think about a baseball broadcast, how often the, the ball is actually in play that you are making a call versus everything else. Like there's so much dead time to put stats in there, have a conversation or do whatever. Like, that's an art to be able to fill that air, especially solo. That that is a that's a tough that's a tough <laughs> task right there. Um, I'm trying I'm trying to think about my verb conjugation because Salty is <laughs> asking me to read something in. That's the thing about Russian is the, the you know there's like subject verb agreement like the endings all change oh, you know. God. Um, I'll just I'll just say um Ya Yuzu Chal Ya Yuzu Chal Menogalet Nazad uh no se chas um moy ruski token de ploha. Your Russian is so so that's what I got at the end. Right. I studied many years ago and now my 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 <laughs> Russian is only so so. So if you turned on like a Russian broadcast, could you follow along with what they were talking about? I can follow just depends on it. Like they talk so fast. Yes, they you know, do. And it's been like yeah. you know thirty going on thirty five years True. or something like that at this point. Um, I can probably follow sixty to seventy percent. It's pretty good. Yeah, it's not a lot it's of people like, can say they can do that with Russian. It's like so. when they get into the deeper, like colloquial language, you oh, know, sure. parts of the language and stuff like that. That that's obviously, yeah. And that's what I actually served during the Cold War. Brandon, yeah. he said I could have thrived during. That's actually when I was in. I went in in 1987, got out in 1991. I was in. I was stationed at a place called Field Station Augsburg in Germany. That was a giant listening station in Bavaria. It's. It's. It was. I think maybe 
60, 70 miles west of Munich, you know, like southern, a little bit north of where, uh, uh, you know, like Hitler and, and the uh, the Eagles, um, the Eagles Lair and all, what would they call that thing? The Eagles Nest, you know, mm -hmm. down there yeah. where, uh, you know, where Hitler, you know, used to hang out and all that different kind of stuff. Easy Company rolled in and, and took over. But yeah, so we had like a big listening area and we used to, it was when, you know, before the wall came down and we were stationed mm -hmm. over there when like the cold war officially ended when the wall came down and, and all that wow. different kind of stuff That's we got to go cool. when they opened up czechoslovakia they opened up that i think first and we we got to go to prague a couple of different times and i think it was the first time we were there hw bush was doing a uh like a thing in downtown prague and the streets are just packed with checks so, but that's enough on that one. Uh, there's one more question about your time in the service. I saw Tommy asked about my rank. Yeah. And it's, it, basically, I think I've talked about this. Ooh, I accidentally unstarted it rather than putting it up on the screen. I got out an E4. I could have been, uh, could have gone to NCO school and been an E5, I think about a year before I was supposed to get out. But I didn't want to, I, I, I didn't feel like, you knew at that so, point you weren't going to be continuing. I knew I was getting out, yeah. and I was like, this is just a waste of time for like an extra 100 bucks a month or whatever it was. <laughs> right. You know, I'm still living in the barracks and still doing, <laughs> you know. The only benefit to being an NCO was, you know, a little bit extra pay, and you got your own room. And I'm like, eh, I'm fine, you know, sharing a room. And what ended up happening was my roommate did go to the NCO school, so I ended up getting my own room anyway. So... <laughs> The only thing hey. I didn't get was the extra money. So hey, that's all right. Drinks are on him. <laughs> that's when you right. Go out. So nothing wrong with that. That's right. That's right. All right. Enough of that. Let's talk some. That's questions. great stuff. I learned stuff during that. <laughs> I've known you a long time, and there's some of that that I knew, and some of that that was new. So that was good. Yeah, but I think the question was about brought. You know, so I came to work here. Worked here at U93. I was there for eight years. They lost the contract and they kind of took that opportunity as the recession was sitting in, you know, to lay me and a couple other people off and and that kind of thing. And and then uh, got back in a few years back with the WSBT radio group. And that's who's got it right now. So I've done a total of 12 years of the Notre Dame women's basketball play by play. But it was something specifically that like the play by play is what I love the most about broadcasting. We were like the classic in college, turn the sound down and watch the University of Kansas basketball games with Bob Davis, you know, like the KU play-by-play -play guy, you know, like we would listen and the delay was not as bad as it is right now either, but we would, you know, listen to him. And you know, most of my friends were Chiefs fans. So we would listen to, uh, for a couple of years, sense. it was Kevin Harlan. And then after that, it was a guy named Mitch Holtis. Mitch Holtis is the guy who's, who's uh, still got it now. Like when, when you ever hear that, Touchdown, Kansas City. Yeah, where he goes nuts, that's Mitch Mitch Holtis. But so my buddies used to do that as well. Like, listen, watch TV with 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 uh, the sound of those guys up. Nice. So Tommy wants to know why do you think Coach Freeman didn't hold Sam Hartman to the same level of accountability as he did when Estime did with Estime when both players had a fumble? I only ask since Free used Sam specifically about not having exceptions my okay so my initial thought on this is be, is the drop off at quarterback was much bigger than the drop off at running back as a coach i feel like it's easier to hold people accountable when i know that the guy going in for them still is going to be still is going to be able to uh, carry the water so to speak I don't think there was a whole lot of faith in what was behind Sam Hartman. Well, and that's the thing. It's it's different with a running back and a quarterback, right? right? Absolutely. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I get it. You know, like, okay, maybe you say, well, a fumble is a fumble. You still have to have the same, you know, accountability or whatever. But it's just quarterback is the most unique position on the field because at the other positions – you know, you can sit the guy and, and theoretically right. get somebody in, especially at running back when they're as deep as they are at running back. I just don't think you can do that at the quarterback position, especially kind of considering, you know, it's it's not like 
Hartman and Angeli were neck and neck. You know, right. Hartman right. Hartman was was pretty far ahead of Steve Angeli. And yes, with the situations that Angeli would have been going into, you know, when the like when those fumbles occurred, you're throwing it, you're 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 throwing a young, inexperienced guy on the road, right, into a tough situation. He has a follow up that I starred, so it's in there, so you can grab it okay. if you want to, uh, which I think is a good, fo- <clears throat> excuse me, a good follow up by Tommy. Um, it's probably towards the bottom. I would there, there we go. He goes follow up to my question. I get the obvious difference in the quality of the depth chart at both quarterback and running back last year. There you go. So he's on the same page as us. But wouldn't that have made the benching of Sam all the more meaningful? Meaningful, sure. Guaranteed loss, probably even more so. Like. You have to calculate. Now, did they lose that game anyway? Yeah. But you you got to – it's just going to a different quarterback is way different than going to a different running back. It's like putting in a different receiver. I mean, it, it's just completely different. You would have to change your offense going from Sam Hartman to Steve Angeli. Right. Not only are you changing the way – what they're good at and what they're not good at, but then all of a sudden the playbook shrinks – a great deal as well. And you're also so, benching a captain. Like that that's has to also be, true. That has yeah. to be factored in there as well. Sam yeah. Hartman was a captain. Yeah. And yeah. You start benching captains that that throws off a lot of things. Yeah. I think. Absolutely. So Especially it's just apples to oranges is, yeah. is what it is. I mean, that's the best way to put it. You, you're making a pretty significant change when you change a quarterback. You're not making a significant change when you change up a running back. But great question. I see where you're coming from, man. I do. Uh, it's just so much harder as a coach to make that change, man. So much harder. Exactly. Joe wants to know, what has you more excited, having two really good coordinators or having a better avenue to the college football playoff? I think Notre Dame's always had a good avenue to the college football playoff. I don't. If Notre Dame takes care of business, they're in the playoff, no matter what iteration of the playoff that we're referring to, right? So I... I think it's fantastic. I, I would much rather have two good to great coordinators, which I think they have right now, because that means the product in the field is going to be better, which then in turn gives you a better shot at the at the playoff. And so I would take the two coordinators all day on this one. Yeah. I mean, they've always had access to the playoff. They've made the playoff twice. And you know, obviously the, the playoff field is going to be expanded and all that stuff. So theoretically, there's at least more access to the playoff. But I would argue like the combination of having that plus the two coordinators that you have, the coordinators put you over the top. So it's the coordinators that excites me as well, because even when you look at who the coordinators were back in, in 2018 and 2020, when they made it, not that there was anything wrong with those guys, but at at the same time, I, I feel as excited about this duo that they've got on each side of the ball as I've been in a long time. When I'm when yeah, I'm looking at who they like, and the you know throw in the combination of the head coach as well, mm-hmm. that whole trifecta there, I think they're just in a great they're in in great shape right now. So that would be it for me as well. Yeah, it's gonna be fun to watch. I'm telling you, this is it's gonna be a fun group to watch. I mean, I'm very excited about the whole the whole situation, the whole enchilada, as they say. Tommy wants to know specialist or corporal army. Now I, I can't speak for if they've changed this over the years, but army back then didn't have corporal. I think they did oh. like pre eighties maybe. And at some point it all just became cause, cause corporal, because my dad was in the Marines as well. Like Tommy and he, you know, he was a like corporal is sort of a, a junior NCO, you know, so like, you know, just like a step below Sergeant kind of thing, but the army didn't have that. So just specialist. I've always been confused, and it's only because I'm not in it, right? I've always been confused about all the ranks and well, and each service yeah. has its, you know, right, again, like yeah, its, its own different. set of ranks. So yeah, yeah. exactly. Just like uh gunnery sergeant. I don't think like Marine Corps has gunnery sergeant. I don't think we had gunnery That's sergeant, true. if I remember right. I, I coached with a guy and we called him Gunny because he used to be a gunnery sergeant in the Marines. Yeah. And he went by Gunny the rest of his life. Like you probably seen Hamburger Hill or whatever movie that was. Um, was it Pork Chop Hill? The the one with Clint Eastwood. Is that the one that you're like Gunny Highway? Is that what no? I'm, I coached that? with a guy that we that that, that was called. Oh, Gunny. he actually was a gunnery sergeant. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And so okay. they called him Gunny. Like that was. I, honestly, I don't know what his real name is. He was just always Coach Gunny. 
So, yeah. Yeah, I think we got agreement about the benching a captain. <laughs> it has. I think that has a big effect. Hamburger Hill. Hamburger Hill. There you go. Thanks, Tommy's Tommy. Always. Bam. That's right. Brandon wants to know the read so far on Mitch Jeter. Are we going to have kicking issues this season, or are you impressed with what you've seen so far? I mean, you know, go ahead, missed yeah. a field goal or two today. Really? And, you know, I, I know Brian had it in his analysis. You know, there's there's not quite the uh, the pop. You know, mm-hmm. the jump of the ball off the foot of Mitch Jeter, like we've seen with a couple of these other guys. But you know, I, how much of it, it? We haven't had a chance to talk to the specialists and that kind of. You know, Marty Biaggi. I think Marty Biaggi might be next week, and we might even get a. Ch- I, I know we talked. We haven't got a chance to talk to him. There's a new operation you got to remember because Michael Vinson is gone, and you got right. a new kicker coming in. You know, so like that's what. I know Marty Biaggi talked about last year, once they got that operation down, and a lot of that happened over the summer, you know, where those guys were able to practice together all summer long, snap, placement, kick, snap, placement, Mm -hmm. kick. So that could have some impact on it as well, because Jeter was used to a different operation when he was at South Carolina. It's completely different now. You know, like just timing the whole thing, the rhythm of the whole thing. I'm not saying that that is the reason because again, we haven't got a chance to talk to those guys yet, right. but, but I, I would say just give it some time because like everything else, it's still really early mm-hmm. in spring right now. I would say from what I've seen and I wasn't there this morning uh, and I, and I understand they did a bunch of PAT field goal type stuff early. Yeah. Uh, but from what I've seen, when I've seen him kicking, he does not have the big boomer leg that the last two guys have had groupie mm-hmm. and uh, Spencer Schrader. They had like it made a sound when they kicked the ball and it like kind of reverberated through the indoor facility. That is not the case. Now, what I will say is I think he's more accurate. I think he probably won't have the distance capability of the last two guys, but I think he's going to be more accurate. And so if you're talking like 45 and in, I think you're looking at probably a a real good chance it's going to go in. You know what I mean? As as opposed to some of the other guys, it was like, well, you know, I'm not really sure which way it's going to go, but it's going to have plenty of leg on it. You know, that kind of a thing. So I, I'm much more confident in kind of the layup kicks because, you know, nothing was a layup when Spencer Schrader was kicking, by the way. I don't know if everybody remembers that. Like nothing was a layup. Like I, we, most people felt bad, better about a 55 yarder than they did about a 35 yarder. Right. And so I feel much better about his, the layups, 40, 40 and in 45 and in like that. I feel much better about the accuracy of Mitch Jeter. We'll see what happens, but you're absolutely right. You do have to give it some time because it is a brand new kind of an operation and a situation. Yeah. And he's kicking in an indoor place that he's never kicked before and all, all of those different things. But uh, I just don't think he's got the – you're not going to see 55, 53 yarders kick from him. That's just not going to happen. Right. And so, But I think the layups will be much more accurate. Yes. We have a correction, and David is absolutely right. The Clint Eastwood oh. movie was Heartbreak Ridge. Well done. Well done, David. Mario mm-hmm. Van Peebles, Heartbreak Ridge. They go down to like, I don't know if they specifically said Grenada, but they went down to Grenada and they had to rescue these students at the end, you know, but it was like Clint Eastwood, you know, getting the getting the unit into shape and all that kind of stuff. They were spoiled Marines, which I don't think, you know, like spoiled and Marines are not two words that I think that, that go... <laughs> hand in hand, but they had become kind of a soft unit. And Clint Eastwood whipped them back into shape in his ah. old school, only the way he can ways, you know, that kind of thing. That's Harper right. Ridge. Good job, David. <laughs> uh, USMA says he was catching up uh, from earlier. He took Russian at the military academy. Always said, if they need my language, there are big problems. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. It's a good Very point. Very true. Very true. Ah, all right. Well, do you want to get to some of these offensive line questions that are in here? Yeah, what the or, heck? Why not? I mean, for rapid fire, what do you want to do? It's up to you. I mean, again, we've had two practices so far, neither of which have had pads on. And so I'm interested to see where the question, I haven't looked at the questions, so I guess we'll see kind of where they go. But yeah. How about this one first? Nick Saban, Salty says, Nick Saban says paying players is destroying college football while Louisville women's basketball coach wants to pay them uh, and find them for mistakes. Who's right and why? 
there, obviously there's a middle ground someplace. Those are two like, uh, you know, diametrically opposed points. Um, I used to fall into the camp of Nick Saban and the way that the NCAA has gone about it. I agree with Nick Saban. NIL isn't necessarily a problem if it's done correctly. If it's, it's, it's actually, you are paying for your name, image and likeness you know, at a car dealership or in a video game or anything like that. I I don't have a problem with that if it's done correctly, okay? Players should be able to benefit from their NIL. They should, right? Because forever, schools were operating on the backs of these players, and so I'm okay with that. Now, I I think less and less importance is being put on how much money they're basically saving by getting a free education. I do think that that's an actual thing, okay? Okay especially at a place like Notre Dame where it's like 75 grand a year and with the kid going to college, like this is all becoming reality for me. And so, you know, that is part of it, but I also believe they should be able to make money on their name, image, and likeness. Now, right. They have completely gone overboard with this thing and it's completely out of control. I have a problem with that. It's, it's terrible. And it, the to- the, but the, the toothpaste is out of the tube as they say, and it's going right. to be really hard to get it back in. And so, I, I guess I fall more on the Nick Saban side because, look, finding players and doing all – like, he wanted to find somebody $500 for a turnover. Like, that is crazy. That's crazy. You could have a point guard uh, – you know, let's say a freshman point guard is thrust into, you know, starting and they have eight turnovers. You're going to find them four grand from right. one game? I mean, like, that's does nuts. Does the head coach get fined for every right. blunder that he makes in decisions exactly. during a game? See, like, that's that's where, ridiculous. Where's the line? Yeah, right, that's yeah. right. I mean, Saban is right, but I think what really upsets <clears throat> Saban more than anything is the fact that NIL opened up doors and avenues for other teams around the country to get all the players that he was getting to Tuscaloosa without that's having fair. to work that hard. That's Most fair because you know? Nick Saban worked his butt off in recruiting. Right. It, nobody can take that away from him. Like he, that's why Alabama became Alabama. Remember when he took over Alabama, they were nothing. They were not a good football program. Yeah. Right. And he recruited his butt off and got dudes in there. And yeah, I, I and, but don't you agree with him a little bit? Like, wouldn't you be upset if you worked your butt off and all of a oh, sudden sure. people get a cheat code to try to get players in? Like, for, I'd be pissed off too. For sure. Yeah. He had it figured out. You know, right. he could promise these guys a path to the NFL. And it's like, look, do it my way. You're gonna you're gonna make it eventually. But now, yep, yeah, because of NIL, these guys are a lot a lot less patient. They're a lot more impatient about whether or not they're gonna play right away and someone offers them a little bit money and it you know because it's not just nil it's the transfer portal combined with the nil and right right. yeah true the impact that has just like that's true look at the jordan addison situation from pittsburgh to usc a couple of years ago you can go worst kept secret ever (laughs) right right yeah yep that's exactly right yep vince how about i just hit you with some rapid fire oh hit me because I feel like I feel like this offensive line thing, we should go ahead and just jump in with some offensive line talk. Yeah, and let's do it. Who better to get us going with some offensive line coach than with some offensive line coach with some offensive line talk than offensive line coach Joe Rudolph? He was one of the people who uh, we got to talk to this morning after practice over at Notre Dame. And here's what he had to say about Rocco Spindler. He's, he, it's been amazing the way he's worked to get himself back to the beginning of spring. And, you know, we weren't sure if we would have him at all in spring or limited in spring. And I would say he's like, I don't know if it's 90%, yeah. but he's going to be, he's doing most everything, but trying to be smart over on a couple and a couple issues, but excited for him to be back and really proud of him that fought himself to get, to get here and be ready to go. All right, so there's Joe Rudolph talking about Rocco Spindler. You know, he was back out there doing a little bit yeah. today. So there were a slew of of questions. I'll boil them down to a couple that Salty had. He said, Billy Shrouth has continued to show impressive quickness, explosiveness, and pad level in practice. Is he a lock at starting right guard? Could he reach Quentin Nelson's level? 
He also says Pat Coogan has been solid at uh, first team left guard in practice, but not equal to Shrouth at right guard. Sam Pendleton, second team left guard. Will Sam be the starting left guard by fall? So kind of keep those, I think, in the back of your mind as mm -hmm. we address the Rocco Spindler is is what happened, you know, because like Rocco Spindler still factors in there as well, even oh, though, yeah. he, you know, 100%. Because he was a starting right guard yep. last year. So is what happens with him the biggest question that the offensive line has? Or how do you look at so, you know sort of these other factors that Salty is outlying around it as well? Loaded questions. I'm trying to decide how to attack this thing. Is right. Rocco Spindler part of this? 100%. He's a returning starter. And the only reason he wasn't starting down the stretch is because he got hurt. Period. And so he should have every opportunity to fight for a starting position. Now, I think we can all agree also that guard, are there nuances between right guard and left guard? Absolutely. You know, you're one, you're down with one hand, one you're down with another. And sometimes that really affects certain guys, doesn't affect other guys. You know, it depends, right? There are three to four guys competing for starting guard spots. I would say of all four, I would say that Billy Shrouth has the the biggest hold on one of those starting spots and i would say the other spot is wide open I, I i would at least i would say that i think from a talent standpoint it has to be that way and that's nothing against pat coogan it's just i think there are guys that could be potentially better than he is we'll see if he's the most consistent though if you can count on him to always go to the right place and do the right thing and then he continues to get stronger and faster then he's going to be able to hold on to that spot, right? Yeah. But but none of these guys should be complacent with where they are. No. I think there's the most competition at the guard spots right now because the depth is so good. I agree. And how how Spindler factors in when he is a hundred percent? Because again, he was he was out there at least a little bit, you know, with the second string when we were out yeah. there. Yeah. That, you know, again, they're not in full pads, so they're not doing everything out there. But the fact that he is out there already i think says a lot and really volume, it kind of yeah. seems like you've probably got what is it one two three basically you've got four guys for the two you know yeah i guess that's what you'd have but it's kind of that's what it is spindler is going to factor into this and Absolutely. whether you know like because the other you know the first part that, that salty said he's continued to show impressive quickness explosive and pad level i would expect billy shrout is going to have one of the spots like do you consider yeah. him a lock at right guard or like how it matters does I, it matter like which one <laughs> is that <laughs> i don't think it matters to be perfectly honest with you i i you know i wouldn't half mind seeing you know uh billy shrouth and uh charles jagasaw on the same side together and but obviously that would that would mean he would have to move over to the left side so <clears throat> excuse me that was weird um i don't i think he could start at either spot and then because I think he could start at either spot, then whoever comes in second place, where are they the most comfortable? And that's where you put the, the guy who comes in second. You put them at their most comfortable spot, and you allow Billy to just dominate at either one. Yeah. That's how I would do it. Yeah, I think so as well. But, again, Spindler is going to be a factor in it. Yeah. You know, it's going to, like, remember last year, we kind of thought we had a pretty good feel for – for what was going to happen uh, coming out of spring. And then fall training camp rolled around and things ended up being a lot different. Oh, yeah. When it was all said and done. Yep. And that could very well happen again this year. I mean, they're going with the same five that they had in the bowl game. I'm not surprised by that, that that's the way they're starting out spring. That doesn't surprise me in any way. Let's see what happens once they put the pads on. They start knocking each other around a little bit. You know, the jersey scrimmage, you know, will be coming up. Uh, you know, in April. And then, of course, you've got spring balls or I mean, uh, the spring game. So, you know, I think it's anybody's game. And this is a great problem to have, folks, that you have competition at these spots. I mean, that's and look, they kill it in, in offensive line recruiting all the time. Yeah. Right? So, like, exactly. you expect them to have this kind of problem. 100%. And it, you obviously don't want injuries to occur, but you can feel a little bit more secure. If you get in, you know, midway through the seat, just like last year, look at what happened when Spindler went out. It gave Shrouth an opportunity and Shrouth made the most of it. Absolutely. So yep. 
right? They're going to be good to go with whoever they end up with is what I feel like. And like we said, there could be four brand new starters on this line that start, you know, that weren't there at game one last year, you know, and that's a lot. But so the other po- of part of Salty's question, and he's answering it himself in the chat, <laughs> he says, could he reach Quentin Nelson's level? And I mean, let's that's remember a, Quentin that's Nelson. A high bar. Yeah. I mean, like, He's an offensive guard who was drafted in the top 10. That doesn't happen very often. And he's plugged right in with the Colts and been all pro all but <laughs> a couple years, I think. And it's really been, you know, like some injuries the last couple of years yeah. that have really slowed him down. So that's that's a huge bar to set. Could he be dominant? Absolutely. Quentin Nelson good, though, is a completely different story. Like, literally a mauler, again, who, like, he was an outlier. You just don't see guards go in the NFL draft where Quentin Nelson went. I mean, yeah, that's going to be my exact point. He was a guard who went in the top 10. And I can't remember exactly where he went, but I know it was in the top 10. Guards don't go in the top 10. Right. That's how once in a generation good he was and is. And so, you know... Could Billy get there? It's a possibility, but that is a high bar to set and to reach. That's going to be tough. I mean, it's about as high a bar as you could see. You know, like they, they, they could easily just call Notre Dame's Offensive Lineman of the Year award the Quentin Nelson yes. award. And I don't like, think anybody would have a complaint about that. Like if they had no. an interior award or something like that, like right. eh, would not be a problem. Would not be. And look, Notre Dame, after Joe Alt gets – Drafted probably number seven to the uh, Titans. Uh, Titans, thank you. Uh, I've seen that a thousand times. <laughs> They're going to have three offensive linemen that have gone in the top ten in the last like eight drafts. I think is what it was. Mm-hmm. That I mean, hello O line, you like that? Notre Dame is putting out some dudes. Okay, it's again high bar to reach for sure. Okay, let's go to the other side of the ball we had the chance to talk to uh al washington today as well the defensive line coach and this isn't necessarily anything related to the defensive line right now although we'll have some more of those comments on tomorrow's show you know just so you're aware pro day tomorrow by the way so we'll have some pro day stuff and you know some more comments from what time uh, is pro day media like 10 o'clock something like that it begins like like the preliminary kind of stuff that apparently we're not allowed to see starts around 10, 10, 15. Okay. So they advised us to kind of come a little bit later around the time when the 40 yard dash and all that gotcha. kind of stuff, because since that's really, you know, what most people want to see is guys run the forties, especially linemen. Well, I'm going to say Audric Estime, one guy yeah. in particular. Yeah, that's but, true. Yeah. So Al Washington, He, of course, interviewed at his alma mater, Boston College, remember? I guess it's been, what, about a month or so ago? He interviewed for the head coaching vacancy there. This is the first time we've had a chance to talk to him since then. So here's what Washington said about that. To be honest, man, it was was so fast. Things happened fast. And um, I can tell you, man, it was was a great experience. It was was great to think about the big picture. And it was great to to, to be connected with my old school. And, um, you know, um, obviously... um, the way I looked at it, I'm in a no lose situation. You know, um, my family's happy here, and um, so it wasn't something where you go for broke. And but the reality is, yeah, I mean, you know, that would have been a great opportunity too. You know, but my daughter wasn't; she was happy I didn't get it. So hey, <laughs> um, it's funny I, when we found out. She said, "Good." I said, "Okay." <laughs> How old is she? She's uh, um, six, six years old. So. Um, but yeah, so it was great, man. It was, it was great, and um, I, yeah, it, it. I want to be great where I am. I want to be um, um, continue to work on being a better coach. But if the, if the stars align again, it'll be, you know, I'll be better for it. Vince, his daughter didn't even want him to get the job. <laughs> I think that's great. I think that's awesome, by the way, because kids will tell you what's up, man. Like they, they will tell you what is up. And uh, I think that's funny because, of course, she's six years old. She didn't want to leave her friends and, yeah. and leave what she knows. Like, she didn't want to go anywhere. So, I love that. is that like first grade, kindergarten, that's somewhere that, around that area? I believe that is probably ending kindergarten. You yeah. know what I mean? Um, yeah. yeah. So, kindergarten. Yeah. I know. You know, 
it kind of like he said with the other stuff there, you know, look, he's gone through the process now and it, he, you know, he said it kind of opened his eyes to the big picture and, That's true. and things like that. So it sounds like a good experience. I'm sure that, I mean, he interviewed for it. It was mm -hmm. his alma mater and he had to be, you know, had a chance to become a head coach. So I'm sure he was a little bit disappointed. You could hear oh, hints sure. of that, but at the same time, you know, he still got a, a great opportunity here and a, you know, a great position at Notre Dame. Look, I think the vast majority of us have interviewed for jobs that we didn't get. And and <clears throat> you you spend time when you're preparing for the interview or like maybe just after the interview, if you felt like it went well, kind of imagining yourself in that position. Mm -hmm. And then when you don't get it, it there, of course, there's going to be some disappointment Definitely and a little down. bit of <laughs> devastation. Right. I mean, that's just how it is. And then you kind of regroup and you get back at it and at the end of the day, a lot of times those opportunities will, op you know, that shut door will open a door someplace else. And that's where you were meant to be. You know what I mean? And I I've had that happen to me a bunch of times in the past. I'm sure that's happened to you in the past as well. Yep. And so it is, I'm sure he could take plenty of positives from it, you know, from the interview process and all of those different things. And I'm sure it was also nice to get back on campus where he went to school. You know, I mean, that, that all by itself was probably pretty neat. You know what I mean? Kind of getting the red carpet rolled out for you and all those fun things. And so sure. I'm sure it was a hell of an experience for him. And uh, I'm sure he learned a lot from it. Yeah. Just got to convince his daughter next time. Yeah. Good luck with that. Uh, <laughs> is what I would say. Good luck. I mean, South Bend, Boston, the weather sure wouldn't be much different. You'd have, you'd have That's more true. Dunkin' Donuts. I mean, even though there's more Dunkin' Donuts now here around town, every time you, you round the corner, but at the same time, you go to Boston, you'd definitely have more Dunkin'. Anyway, that's right. It's not they they took away the donuts. It's just Duncan. Duncan. That's right. Yeah. They rebranded yep. themselves. Yep. I'm all about the coffee anyway. Like I I can't even remember <laughs> the last time I bought a donut when I went to that's Duncan. Fair. I'm all about the coffee. You know what a coffee fiend I am. So I do. I I've been in the car when you've ordered from Duncan. <laughs> that's very true. <laughs> yeah, Brandon, the uh the combine's gonna be on Peacock tomorrow. And I think Ooh. Tony Simeone and uh, uh Corey Robinson. I believe I saw are going to be kind of doing the uh, like the TV work. That would be that. that would be a brutal telecast to have to announce. There's going to be so much downtime in between things, and so like, I'm sorry, a I lot mean, of video, a lot of just let it roll. That's true. Yeah. You know? Right. 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 That would be brutal. Yep. Pro day tomorrow. So we've got that again coming up tomorrow over at Notre Dame. So back to the offensive line, the biggest topic of conversation for Emil Wagner has been his weight. His official listed weight on the Notre Dame website is 281 pounds. Now he said today that he is closer to 290 now. So he said he's already put on a little bit of weight, but here's kind of the rundown. He said what it looks like is he is trying to pack on the pounds now getting close to closer to 300 pounds. Reese, I think at my peak, I was eating nearly like 8,000 calories. 8, um, I think I, we tracked it one time. It was, I had like 4,500 for a breakfast one time. And it was like five eggs, burrito, <laughs> potatoes, uh, right. 1,500 calories in muffins, 2,000 in the shake. And so um, really just being able to put those calories in and put the work in. Um, a lot of people will see it like, or think it's like a chore for me, but really it's just another step in my process of improvement. And so I don't mind it at all. Eight thousand calories. Would that would that be more punishment or reward? Eating eight thousand calories a day. Have you ever even like sat and looked at what your calorie intake is? Do you have any clue like how many calories you might put in your body a day? Sean Styers, you have sat and looked at me, <laughs> so I think you know the answer to that question. I have no idea what how many calories are in what. I have no idea. But I would also so say you're like me when I was a teenager. Yeah. Zero clue. It's just eat. Yes. Just eat and go and have a great time with it. Um that's why it's this why this is this. Um, but I would say that eight thousand calories is probably like eight thousand calories in this body would be a lot different than eight thousand calories in his body, who's pushing seven foot as opposed to me, who's barely not even pushing six foot you know what i mean so like yeah. it's a little bit different from a you know a scenario like you know that kind of a scenario but 
it would be punishment to me. Like, there's no way I could hold that kind that much food in my body. There's no chance. Like when no we chance. go to breakfast, everyone, you know, like every, like maybe every couple months we'll do breakfast on a Sunday morning or something like that. And that's just like typical, like some eggs, a biscuit, some sausage, some bacon, right. you know, so, you know, like some, uh, you know, hash browns or, you know, like that, that's not that much. You know, it's probably a couple ca thousand calories alone right there, but I am just wasted the rest of the day <laughs> just, <laughs> right, just right. from going out to breakfast. And that's yeah. even if I get out and do some exercise before we go to breakfast, you know, which in theory, you know, kind of sure. get your engine revved up a little bit. I, I could try to stuff. Now, granted, he's like, you know, a foot taller than me. And, you know, obviously a lot longer frame and the whole thing to begin with. And his metabolism has got to be crazier just because he's also a lot younger yeah. than either one of us. But yes, 8,000 calories, man. I just shove it. I, I think wasn't Michael Phelps like back when he was swimming, you know, something oh. like 10 to 12,000 calories. Swimmers a day burn with all calories. Of his training. Yeah. yeah. Swimmers burn calories like crazy. And they're in the pool. There for it is. Hours and hours and hours at a time. Yeah. Yeah, there, that doesn't surprise me at all. Look, when I was a teenager and like me and my friends would hit like uh, Ryan Steakhouse or something like that, like uh -huh. they they lost money with us walking in the door. Like there's no doubt about that. And I can't, I couldn't, I can't put it away like I used to. You know what I mean? But I would be very curious to see how many calories I used to put away when I was a teenager, yeah. when I was playing three sports a year and like, you know, I don't even doing know all those things. Like, Somebody, I think DK said the pizzas. Like I would definitely, I love pizza. So I would be eating a lot of pizza. <laughs> I would be eating a lot of burgers, you know, probably a lot of tacos. And <laughs> like sure. I just, oh yeah. But again, like at some point it gets old, I think. And there's only so, so much space in your exactly. belly. You know what exactly. I mean? Like I, my stomach is so much small. Well, my internal stomach is so much smaller than it ever used to be. When I was a kid, like I can't eat that much. Like I just can't do, I only eat two meals a day, even now, you know, a, a, a moderate breakfast and then dinner. Like that's what I eat. You know, I don't eat I lunch am. twice a day. That's yeah. Right. I don't eat lunch. People that's are like, right. how can you not eat lunch? I'm like, well, I'm too busy. I don't even have time to sit down, but like, I just, I've gotten used to it. So like my body is like, okay, breakfast, dinner, there we go. Let's roll. So yeah, that's a lot of calories, man. Brandon Woo. wants to know if we're buying Wagner at 290. I mean, I mean, I didn't go down there and try to pick him up, right? Now, you know, like skinny. He looks. What's skinny. the difference? Like in yeah, ten he, pounds. He's a pretty good know. sized guy. Standing yeah. like he granted he was sitting and I was standing, but like ten pound difference between two eighty and two ninety. It, it's hard to differentiate for me, right? But I mean, ten pounds on that big. He of a was. Frame. He yeah. was. Like you could tell, you know, because he talked about not just the. Uh, he's ha he said he's having a hard time, you know, kind of packing on you know, sort of like the extra, you know, fat, you know, to really build the girth. But at the same time, he said, it. you know, he's added a lot of muscle since he's been here, just with, you know, with the, you know, between uh, Matt Bayless and now Lauren Lando with the training that, you know, that that he's doing with them, that that, that the muscle has come. And and Josh Burnham was, was asked today about Emil Wagner as well and said, you can tell that he's a lot stronger now, you know, when you're, when you're going up, he goes against, up against him. him yeah. So, yeah, so you know that's, you know if it, if it's if it's muscle, good weight as opposed to just pure girth from all yeah. those extra pizzas and burgers and stuff like that. <laughs> I, he's just got one of those frames where it's going to be a challenge for him to try to pack that on. It's just always going to be a challenge, and, and as soon yeah. as he's done playing football, he's probably going to immediately like drop down to two fifty again. You know, right? So. Yeah, seriously. Tough problem to have, I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah, no doubt. He's going to – I mean, and but that's, again, I mean, I'm sure a lot of the offensive linemen are on similar diets, to be honest with you. And that's why, you know, Joe Thomas, for example, or a lot of these offensive linemen that once they're done playing, it's like – it's like somebody took the air out of them. I mean, they just – they get down and they, they look great. I mean, they look fantastic. It's amazing. You would never guess that they were offensive linemen at the, at the highest level, mm -hmm. you know? Exactly. Fill in the blank. Hannah Hidalgo being named a first team Associated Press All American today is blank. Payoff for a great season. I mean, I I have a hard time disagreeing with it with the stats that she put up and the big moments that she's had already. And now we get to see what they're going to do in the tournament and possibly some big moments there. 
think she absolutely deserves it. Yeah, she's a freshman, but this team isn't where they are right now without her. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Handful of things here. She Juju Watkins, the USC freshman guard, was also named AP All-American today. Those two, they did it in the same year, obviously. There are only five freshmen all time who have been named first team wow. AP All-American. And two of them just did it this year. Hannah Hidalgo is one of them. So, like, wow. think of it in that aspect. Wow. Only five have ever done it, and well, Hidalgo did it. And there you and go. two, you know, I find it pretty striking that um, she's named AP First Team All-American, not Second Team All-American. There are no other ACC players who are named First say. Team All-American. Huh. She was not the ACC Player of the Year. I think right. that just trumps ACC Player of I the agree. Year, though. I agree, 100%. Because you know what? All Americans, like in the football stadium, the All Americans get a nice area. You know, they get a helmet put up and like yep. the whole deal, right? And I'm sure they've got something similar to that over uh, in in Rolf's, where the the you know the women and the men have their practice facility and all of that. It's a much bigger award than the ACC Player of the Year, much bigger award. So congratulations to her; she absolutely deserves it and deserved ACC Player of the Year as well. But Hey, man, you can take this one to the Nice bank. consolation if you can be first-team like All-American, I think. I like it. One of the most prestigious All-American awesome. honors that you can get. That's so, awesome. Yeah. So in your men's bracket, Vince, which number one seed is most likely to be upset the earliest? So this was tough because I have not I, – I have been slacking on finishing up my men's bracket because there's – there's, I need to do more research, right? My son okay. comes home and he's like, I've got four. I've got four ready to go. <laughs> I'm like, well, you only need to pick one to be in the IB one. And he did. But anyway, I looking at the number ones, I'm going to go with Houston. I'm going to go with Houston. I think they have the ability to be upset first. I think they could have a potentially a, a tough game against Duke. Uh, they, you know, I just, they, they're the, the weakest of the four to me of the four number ones. And so I was very tempted to go with Purdue on this one. Yeah. Because I Purdue just is, don't trust them in the big games. And that's it. Purdue okay. is is who it should be. Like Brandon says Purdue or Houston. It's funny because I've got Houston going to the final four, but I could easily see them getting knocked out, you know, like the way they got thumped by Iowa State in the Big 12 championship game last week after putting a thumping on Kansas right before the Big 12 tournament. And, you know, like they also got thumped by Kansas back at home about a month ago. So it's like, what team is this Houston team? Like, and I think right. you can say that about just about all these teams, though. You because, can. You can, like, yeah. When I looked at the bracket for these teams, it's like everyone's everyone's talking about how tough the UConn bracket is. I really don't think it's all that tough. And I look at the path for most of these number ones, it's not that tough, and, and that includes Purdue. And here's the thing about Purdue, because you're right, like they have never fared well in the tournament. And, and I really, again, continue to be unimpressed by their guard play. But do you remember what happened to Purdue last year? They became just the second number one seed to lose to a 16 seed when they lost to Fairleigh Dickinson. Oh, in the I first remember. Because I'm pretty sure I had Purdue winning it all last year in my bracket. So I'm sure you did. I remember. Well, what happened the last time? a number one seed, Virginia. Remember when they got beat by UMBC in the first sure round? Do. What did they do the next year? They won the, won the national, national championship. championship. Yeah. So, like, Good point. now that doesn't mean Purdue's going to, but history says, uh, like, just because, you, you know, you stunk yeah. it up one year. Not wrong. So, I don't know, man. Uh, um, I still think that it's Purdue, j just based on their history, because they don't tend to fare well come tournament time. Yeah. They're, they're, they're too reliant on Zach Eady. So you need guard play in the tournament and yep. their guard play is less than stellar. Yep. So I'll, I'll, I'll stick with Purdue, even though like That's looking fair. at, looking at the matchups, I don't see it. Like there's no team that jumps out and says right. like, this right. is going to be the one that does it. I'm just right. looking at, at their history. Yeah. You know, will it be Utah state in the second round? You know, Gonzaga and Kansas are both over there on the same side of the bracket with them, but neither one of them are as good this year as they usually are. So I don't know. Yeah, but I'll, I'll go with Purdue. I'm going to stick with Purdue. I love it. Awesome. All right. 
Last question tonight. I saw this posted the other day. If you could choose one of these options, which would you pick? You can travel 50 years into the past. You can travel 50 years into the future. Or you can have $100 million. Which of those three options are you picking? So I I spent way too much time thinking about this particular question. Uh, and I don't know why. But I've always liked the history, right? I've always liked history. I went to school. I got a history degree, right? So I've always liked history. The problem is 50 years ago, it's in the 70s. Like that's not the history that I really want to hang out in. Wow, that's true. 50, that's how old I'm getting. <laughs> I know. I was, thinking, I was thinking 50 years was the yeah. 60s. <laughs> I had to think but about it too, I was born. <laughs> that's the sad part. Okay. But you're right. 50 years ago is 1974. Right. Like how, eh. <laughs> I have no desire to go to 1974. Yeah. I, I would much rather go to like the 50s or something like that. Like that, I would... I've always kind of dreamed about living in the fifties, like when you wear a suit and a matching hat and like the whole thing. Like I uh -huh. always thought that, that was kind of cool, right? So I got to scratch the going in the past for 50 years because I have no desire to live in the 70s. Okay. Now going ahead 50 years, I think that could be very intriguing, you know, but you kind of the back to the future vibes and you uh -huh. know that whole thing. Love that trilogy. 50 years a long time, though. It's like you don't know what you're getting yourself into. Oh, <laughs> at least right. going to the past, you know what's there. <laughs> this you know? is true. This is true. But at the end of the day, and this is going to sound corny, and that's fine. I'll take the hundred million and hang out with my family and friends that I I know I have. Yeah, I don't want to leave them. I don't want to leave my family and my friends. Because so. on the one side, the benefit to going back into the past is you know you you know like what all the results of all these like the World Series and the Super that's Bowl true. and you know all these different things you know all these championships are going to be. So, so you could lay a little something, something on it's that. True. You can you know, make assuming, some assuming you're going back at your full age and you're not going to regress to like what you were, you know, like that's before you were born. So it's I true. guess I'd be a fetus. You know, yeah. Yeah. So like you could do that. You know, I was thinking that you could do something like invest in Apple or Nike or whatever, but I don't even know, like, <laughs> right. you know, like if you could only kind of hang out like 50 years ago, like, Obviously, some of those things weren't even around then. So I don't even know that you could necessarily invest in those things. Sure. So, and then, you know, like I said, you go to the future, you don't know what you're getting yourself into. Seriously. You know, like, are you going to go, like, are you going to run into the Terminator, you know, 50 years <laughs> down the road? Which, right. by the way, I think wasn't the Terminator like supposed to have been like from sometime kind of around this Is year? Really? You know, like, I'd have to yeah. look that up. Yeah. I think so. I think we're right in, you know, like where that was supposed to be set. Wow. Originally, but I, I agree. I'll just take the hundred million bucks. You don't that's have to a lot of money travel. And yeah, that's a lot of money. And I would say that no butterfly you, effects, right? You if, any of that stuff. if you, if you really want me to consider going back or forward or what, you got to lower that dollar amount. Like a hundred million dollars is a lot of money. That's a lot of money. That's a lot. Of, I, I would take 10 million. I would take a million. Right. And still stay. Honestly, if it was only a million, that would kind of change things. Okay. So, you know, so like that's it, the amount it for you. Me, it would make okay. me think a little bit more. Like okay. a million is still a nice amount of money. Sure. But, you know, again, like I, I think that I could go back, set up a couple of bank accounts and, you know, lay some wagers, you know, for all these championship <laughs> events, you know, and make more than a million bucks and you make it back then and you adjust for inflation by the time you get here. You know, I think you're doing pretty well. If it's only a million dollars, you're just a Biff Tannen at heart. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Get that book. <laughs> Gray's Sports Almanac. That's right. <laughs> Brandon wants to know how far I think Kansas is going. I'm 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 going to be honest, Brandon. I don't think they're probably going very far. Um, I filled out my bracket, of course, before they announced that Lance McCuller Jr. is going to miss the entire tournament i actually do have them knocking off purdue um Ooh. you know again because i think purdue is is you yeah. know yeah. they're they're gonna get knocked out you know earlier than than a number one seed should how much i actually believe kansas is gonna do that is, <laughs> is not really very existent but there's no money on the line for this bracket so i felt like i kind of had to I, my thinking was there's nothing expected of them going into this tournament compared, you know, to the last. That's year. fair. Yeah, so, that's fair. So maybe they maybe they ride it a little <laughs> bit farther. But I legitimately 
don't think they will. So, all right. Well, that is going to do it for tonight. Appreciate you as always. Again, we've got Notre Dame's Pro Day tomorrow over at the old Irish Athletic Center. Did you have something to say? One final reminder about our bracket bracket. challenge. That's right. Go over to ESPN, create a profile. Ivy Nation Sports Talk is the group. So come on and join. We have just under 100 people in the men's bracket. 96 currently. And we're up to 36 in the women's bracket. So... You can fill out a bracket, one for the men's, one for the women's. Jump in. Let's have some fun. We will be talking about it over the next uh, you know, few weeks and checking out the leaderboard and seeing where everybody's at and having some fun with it. So make sure you guys get over there. And again, the, the password is Irish Breakdown, all one word, capital I, capital B. Uh, obviously, a lot of people have figured it out. So uh, come on over and join us. Grand prize is you get to sit in a uh, time travel course taught by Vince D'Addario. So <laughs> it's all based on the supplemental materials. We'll be back to the future trilogy. So <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> all right. Hit the like button before you go. And of course, subscribe, rate, and review. And we will talk to you tomorrow on IB Nation Sports Talk. See you.